Hey all, Choi Boy here. Welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about how you can invest $1,000 in sharesies. More in detail about how you can diversify that $1,000 in sharesies. I chose sharesies because it's probably one of the uprising kind of popular platform we have in New Zealand. And I use it myself. So I think it's a nice pick of platform. It has funds, it got company stocks for New Zealand based ones, and it's also looking into adding US stocks in the near future. So it's pretty interesting. And I do want to say thank you for subscribing to the channel. I've seen a lot of subscribers subscribing nowadays uh, to the channel. It's really motivating despite the fact that I haven't been uploading much because I've been mentally stressed because of the lockdown period and also at work as well. So it hasn't been a really good time for me. I'm talking to a counselor and all that kind of stuff. So that's the main reason why I haven't been uploading so often. Hopefully I can get through this video and put this out pretty soon. So stay tuned and let's get straight into it. I got a presentation for you today. Disclaimer before we get into it, please note that I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not legally allowed to give people financial advice. Please take this presentation and my video with a grain of salt and do your own research before you invest in anything I talk about, whether there are funds or whether there are uh, company stocks, please do your own research before you get into it and please don't copy the examples I talk about because those are just examples. I'm just gonna be explaining why you would invest thousand dollars in those ways but it doesn't mean you should do it the same way so just please keep that in mind and we'll get straight into it first one is funds so let's move my webcam here funds there's two main types of funds that you should be aware of there's etfs and there's managed funds ETF stands for exchange traded funds it pretty much mimics the market trend for a certain sector and what it does is it's a collection of company stocks that meets that criteria and it sells it out to the public like a normal stock that you'd buy for a company but instead you're buying a well diversified collection of stocks and pretty much for ETFs if the market trend is going upwards then it normally goes up if the market trends go downwards then it goes down it's pretty simple it's very very easy to understand if you read about it so that's why a lot of people do prefer to do dollar cost averaging on ETFs it's a very popular way of investing for beginners and even for well experienced investors on the other side you got managed funds managed funds are actively managed by some kind of fund manager and its purpose is to beat the ETF performance its purpose is pretty much to beat the market trend so it's actively managed so it beats the norm Sure, some good years it might do better than the ETF, some years it might do worse. And there is a bit of debate on which one is better, ETFs or managed funds over the long run. But that's for you to research and make a decision out of. But if you were to do $1,000 just in funds, this is how you could do it. So $1,000 in funds. So. There's two ways you can really do it. You can do NZ based, mainly because maybe you think the US economy is not looking that great and you don't really want to touch it. You don't want to touch Europe. You don't want to touch Asia or anything like that. You just want to focus on New Zealand based stuff. Then you can do it New Zealand based funds. There's quite a bit in sharesies. For example, the NZ top 10 is my favorite amongst all of it, to be honest, mainly because New Zealand economy is pretty small in my opinion. And the New Zealand top 10 covers a lot of the good side of the economy. And the NZ top 50 is a bit more popular in my opinion amongst the public. But I think the NZ 50 is a bit more riskier than the NZ top 10 because the NZ 50 has a lot of companies that are also being hit really hard due to COVID-19. And it's not as robust as uh, S&P 500 comparing it to the NZ top 50. So I think NZ top 10 compares well to S&P 500 more than the top 50. So that's one reason why I put more money into NZ top 10. NZ responsible fund is a fund managed by AMP. I personally don't really like managed funds to be honest, but it's something that a lot of people do prefer to get into 
to beat the market pretty much please do that with your own research but you could put 200 bucks into responsible fund then you can do a bit of bond funds bond funds pretty much a collection of bonds from governments and companies and then you've got the NZ dividend fund which has a collection of companies that pays good dividends if you were to do a dividend portfolio then i would prefer to actually invest into the company themselves rather than a fund because i don't think it performs that well compared to if I were to do it myself with individual companies. So that's how you could do it with the NZ fund. Then you got a more global one. For example, you can put a lot of um, your money in the US large growth fund, which is pretty much like a replica of the S&P 250 or something like that. Then you can put in the NZ top 50 if you would like. You can replace that with the NZ top 10. You can put into some Australian top 20 fund because um, they talk about the Australian uh, economy is going to do better and people are expecting the stock market to follow the same trend. At this point in time, I do want to tell you the economy does not directly correlate or is not proportional to the stock market trend. It's not the same thing. And just because one thing is doing good does not mean the other has to do good and vice versa. If the other does bad, the other doesn't have to do as bad. Does that make sense? So please bear in mind and do more research between economy and stock market. It's a slightly different kind of concept. The economy is a wider and a broader topic than the stock market. It's got relevance, it's got strong relevance, but it's not exactly the same thing. So please bear that in mind. And then you got emerging markets, you got second tier economic countries that are rising towards like a level of the US, but it's not quite up there. And emerging markets are like the medium sized companies that's got a lot of potential. It's kind of like a Tesla of the countries where it's rising real fast and it has potential to become like a big blue chip company in the future so that's the kind of thing you'll be looking into and it really depends on f your preference on how you want to invest NZ based funds does seem a bit more safer nowadays just due to the uncertainty in the global scale so um, that's the things you have to look into when you want to get into funds these are just examples these are decent portfolios moving on blue chips who doesn't like blue chips? So not going to be having an example for blue chips. I'll be explaining more portfolio examples, well balanced, low risk, balanced and high risk portfolios later on. So please stay till the end because that's when I'll be giving out more better examples of a collection of funds and companies as well. Blue chip companies are pretty simple. It's companies that has a good national reputation and it has a good financial record and pretty much has a cash flow whether it's a good economy or not. So it's normally the things that people will continue to use whether the economy is going up or down. So those are the kind of companies that attract a lot of people because it's a safer option compared to smaller companies and medium sized companies. Like for example, Tesla is not considered a blue chip but it has a lot of potential to become a blue chip. That's the main difference here. Tesla can be very volatile depending on whatever situation where blue chips are a bit more stable in that sense. And for example, in the US, you got blue chips like Apple, Microsoft and Amazon, and you got like Walmart. You got the companies that are big, they drive the economy, they have a big portion of the economy pretty much. And um, that's the kind of things that makes a blue chip and a big company and they normally make a pretty good addition to dividends not all blue chips give good dividend yields i mean a lot of big companies do they don't necessarily have to be a blue chip it's not that clear on what makes a company a blue chip or just a big company or just a medium-sized company there's no clear indication it's kind of like up to you really but i guess there is a bit of concepts behind what makes them in each kind of category so blue chips are very um popular in that kind of sense it's a safer option for investors in the long run then you got smes and small caps they're normally a bit higher risk but can yield higher results higher rewards um in the new zealand market i would say they're around 500 million and downwards are considered to be SMEs and small caps. The thing is that the SMEs and the small caps and the big companies, as I said, every country has a different kind of economic size. And for that reason, it 
differs for each country or each continent of how they split up the companies into these sectors. Um, there is a special case um, with COVID-19. They dropped a lot of specific companies stocks prices all the way down to these levels like for example Kathmandu used to be a well over a billion dollar company now it was worth below 500 mil at certain at a certain point so that's the kind of thing that is special about nowadays which causes some discussions and debates to make on if it will recover back to a more than a billion or not and that's the kind of things you'll be looking into that's a kind of a not so common thing even for a global financial crisis you don't expect a company to just go a fifth of its stock price in a month it's not that common at all very historic really those are the things um, you'd be looking into in SMEs is you want to take a bit more of a gamble and you want to make a better reward in the long term and lastly what you've been waiting for is the portfolio examples Portfolio options, there's really two main options. Do you want to go low risk or high risk? No, it's three options because there's a balanced risk. And this is what a lot of people would lean towards as a balanced risk portfolio. Because some people are not that happy with just a low risk or just a high risk because for vice versa reasons. For those reasons, people like to diversify between funds and different market cap sized companies to balance out their portfolio obviously depending on the times and especially with the speculative and uncertain times like now um, people tend to make a lot of mistakes in how they try to time the market and stuff like that so it's quite risky times and a lot of people make mistakes at this time so please beware of that in the long term if you want to go low risk you'll be going into funds and blue chips and big companies and maybe even a dividend portfolio that one's a bit debatable mainly because you can see that a lot of New Zealand companies well-known New Zealand companies has cancelled their dividends like I'm pretty sure all the travel based ones and retail based ones Kathmandu Z Energy also cancelled their dividends if you were holding companies these companies then um, you would have been a bit screwed there um, so that's debatable if it's a low risk because you wouldn't have got your passive for the half year on the higher risk parts you got SMEs you got small caps and you got the COVID-19 impacted ones those are a big gamble because you don't know if some of them are actually going to recover from it remember if a financial crisis comes it can even knock out a big company uh, you just don't know about the future of a company and if a company does one or two big mistakes they're gone it's not that easy for a company to go bankrupt especially if it's a big company but it does happen so just bear that in mind and not all COVID-19 impacted companies would be a good good deal because some of them might not recover so just bear that in mind when you look into these kind of portfolios and examples first one is low risk example so how would I do a $1,000 portfolio on a low risk based portfolio now I would have some funds and some blue chips that's the main kind of thing you'd be looking for low risk um, NZ Bond Fund, New Zealand Responsible Fund and the NZ Top 10 Fund. Those will be my top three if I did want to put some funds in. Um, to be honest, personally, I would just put it under NZ Top 10. All that $500 into NZ Top 10, I think that's a better choice for my kind of level. But I guess um, diversifying even within the funds is not a bad idea. And I'll have some blue chips. For example, I have a bank, Westpac got Fish and Pickle Healthcare, got A2 Milk, got the Auckland Airport and Spark Telecommunications. They all represent a different sector as you can see banking, healthcare products, uh, dairy, travel based airport infrastructure and telecommunication infrastructure and service. So these all serve a different sector so diversifying amongst a broad wide range of sectors is really important because if a certain sector is going to get impacted so hard for some reason for example COVID-19 hit the retail um, travel 
and entertainment really, really hard for obvious reasons, social distancing and people not going out of their homes and stuff like that. Yeah, those got really wrecked. For example, Auckland Airport would be the one that got impacted the most out of these companies here. But bank still runs, they still get the cash. Sure, they dropping the interest rates and stuff like that, but they still make money at a time like this. Fish and Paco Healthcare, they make products for COVID-19, specifically respiratory products and stuff like that, so that's not bad. A2 Milk, they make milk. I mean, people are not gonna change milk just because the economy is bad. They're gonna keep drinking whatever they were drinking. Spark Telecommunications, I mean, people use phones and and landlines and broadband regardless. Um, we can't live without internet nowadays, so I don't think they're gonna run out of business anytime soon. So those are the kind of things you'll be thinking about about a low risk, is what will have a business even when the economy is bad or when it's good, you know? Uh, so those are the things you'll be looking for in a low risk portfolio. Then you got a balanced risk one. So $1,000 in a balanced risk, um, you'd be looking into more global scale funds, um, obviously, uh, be looking into NZ Top 10 still, and the US Large Growth Fund, which, uh, which is my favorite US fund, then I'll probably make some uh, investments in the emerging markets, possibly not, uh, give and take really, um, you don't need to diversify too many into too many funds. Over diversification is something I'm not really liking to be honest as time goes on. I think just picking quite a few good funds and a quite a good few companies is a better choice for the um, amount of reward you get for the risk. I think it's a better way of getting more rewards um, by not over diversifying pretty much. Then you will be mixing up some big companies with smaller companies this time. It's a balanced risk. You do want to make a bit more money than the low risk. Um, obviously, you are increasing the risk level at this point, but you're willing to take that risk. And that's why you're looking for a balanced risk portfolio. For I still got A2 Milk there. I got Oceania um, Retirement Villages. Not a bad idea with the increasing aging population so that's one thing Kathmandu has been heavily impacted by COVID-19 so I think they have a strong business and they are very iconic to New Zealand I don't think the government or New Zealand itself wants to lose an iconic brand like Kathmandu so hopefully I am banking on them recovering Augusta is like a really small REITs company property investment type and you know they normally have pretty good cash flow but they have been hit pretty hard due to COVID-19 as well and stuff like that. So you're banking on them making a good recovery in the long term. And you got something like Abano. Abano has a lot of subsidiaries for a lot of these small companies that provide healthcare services like luminous dentists and stuff like that. So I think they will have more business to come because it's essential for the people. Healthcare is a really nice sector to be in at any time of the year, really. And you're expecting more people to visit the dentist and getting their um, x-rays and stuff like that and MRIs and stuff like that. So I think Abano has a really good recovery there. So that's the kind of things I'll be looking into. Still spreading it around different sectors is really, really important. A dividends fund, a bit of a shaky one but I'll just touch on it real quick for example I'll be banking it on bigger companies for dividends because bigger companies has a better chance of paying out the dividends as expected instead of just cancelling it obviously COVID-19 has not been nice to a lot of big companies as well and they are forcing like Air New Zealand, Auckland Airport, Z Energy as I expected as well. Those are all big companies and they fail to pay out their dividends for obvious reasons. So I think that's the kind of things you need to think about is what are the things that people will use regardless of anything really unless the world just blows up, right? So banks are normally like my best bets because they're normally like the ones that drive 
the economy in a country especially in a small country like australia and new zealand you got sky city there as well they normally have a really good one but obviously they've been impacted by covid 19. you got kpg which is kiwi property group which holds a lot of shopping malls and stuff like that and they rent it out to tenants so those normally have a pretty good cash flow in normal sense so that's a nice one um to have spark telecommunications same thing blue chip company for telecoms and a lot of people use them so um, their cash flow would be minimally impacted hopefully nzx um, exchange they run whether the economy is good or bad victor vct also a nice one energy infrastructure they hold a monopoly there so that's a nice one to hold because of their cash flow does not really get impacted in most climates then you got like places like meridian energy providers people still use energy in their homes and i don't think that's going to change so these are the things that you'll be thinking about when doing dividend based portfolios obviously you'll be looking at the dividend yield as well but that's for you to do more research i'm not going to go into too much detail for dividends then i got high risk Please remember this is only an example. Please do your own research before you do anything like this. This is like the most high risk things you can do. These are the... Did I... Does it say balanced risk? Okay, that's high risk. Sorry. Um, that, 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 that's not right. It's, it's a high risk. So the main thing I thought about when making this high risk example is what's been in the sectors that's been impacted the most by COVID-19 travel entertainment and retail and small cap companies and stuff like that so these are the things i talked about abano Kathmandu, uh, new zealand wind farm obviously very small uh energy generating wind farm plexia is a small tech company sko circo it's a travel management app uh, vgl vista uh, they make software for cinemas obviously they're not running at the moment but OCA we talked about Air New Zealand's been completely smashed and they've gone for a bailout package and stuff like that so obviously that's a really big gamble for the short term to midterm at least but hopefully in the long term they do recover reasonably well blt bliss technologies um they make probiotics and stuff like that so those are the things that people might be thinking more of especially after COVID-19 hit, they'll be thinking more of like immune systems and stuff like that. And THL, tourism holdings, that's a pretty risky one because you don't know when the travel business will be booming again. Might not be in the next five years or so. So the main thing you'd be thinking about is how much do you believe in each of these companies? I think is the main thing here. Um, you need to do the research financially and the product itself and the target audience. And these are the things you need to really think about for small companies and uh, heavily impact the companies due to COVID-19 and um, hopefully you're not expecting all of them to boom I mean it would be really nice if all of them boom but it might not be the case I think um, this kind of portfolio is what maybe some people might be going into I mean I'm kind of like doing a very high risk myself so a lot of the companies I've invested I put all into this um, into this example as well I'm banking on high risk because I don't have that much money in the stock market. So I thought I'd make a bit of risk because they do say the recession is a golden opportunity for people. I'm willing to take the risk of my portfolio not performing that well if it doesn't go the right way, but it will perform really, really well if it goes towards what I've anticipated the market to do in the five to 10 year range. So that's the kind of thing I'll be thinking about um it's not for everyone to be honest it's mentally stressful if you don't know how to handle volatility and um yeah it's very uncertain for a lot of these companies i've listed here um so please bear in mind that this is not recommended for everyone um please do your own research heavily if you want to do anything like this which is high risk so that's pretty much it if you liked today's video please give me that thumbs up put a comment down below what you thought and any companies you would like me to clarify on please put a comment down in the section below subscribe to the channel for more updates and put the bell notification to get updated the next video will be a sharesies update for may 2020 so that's my portfolio update stay tuned for that see ya
Something.